Hey guys, my name is Curtis Hall and I am host of The Square Podcast. The Square is a sports podcast where me and my co-host, my father, dive into discussions centered around NFL and NBA topics. If you're looking to become a part of a community of sports fans that, that want to get in-depth analysis, check out our show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And if you're looking to have direct discussions with me or other sports fans, check out our show on Twitter. Uh, it's at the underscore square pod. Again, you can find the show wherever you get your podcast, and we can't wait to see you there. Welcome to Fandom Power. Landscape at Marvel Comics has changed a lot since the company's near bankruptcy back in the 1990s. And today, while the sales of physical comic books continue to decline, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has become the highest grossing film franchise of all time, having generated $22.59 billion US dollars at the global box office. And, while the MCU's feature offerings have been a smorgasbord of yearly blockbusters, the Marvel television landscape has been, shall we say, a little less reliable. Partnerships with ABC Studios and Netflix promise shows claiming to be fully integrated with the larger framework of the MCU, but, like a promise made during an election year, the actual results haven't exactly lived up to the hype. But then, on January 15th, 2021, Marvel Studios released WandaVision, the first Marvel television series set well and truly at the center of the MCU. And for nine episodes that span the gamut from subversive to spectacular, viewers were treated to a superhero project like nothing else we've ever seen before. And as of this recording, WandaVision has been wrapped up now for two weeks, and today we're going to take a look back at the series and find out if it lived up to our expectations. Episode four. Where are we at with episode four? Eric? Episode four. We interrupt this broadcast. Boop, boop, Love boop. it. I'm very thankful that you guys let me pick this one because it's the it's one of the only ones that doesn't have any of those, you know, background sitcoms. <laughs> There's no sitcom element to tied to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this episode, and I'm a little more cynical than you guys with my synopsis. Sure, um, sure. Episode four is. The B and C plots of the Marvel Cinematic Universe come together to explain that, yes, this is still a Marvel property. Ah, uh, nice. <laughs> so the through line here is this is the first episode outside the hex. Yeah. And it's kind of the big exposition dump. This is where, you know, the, the very first thing we see is the end of the blip. Yep. So you, you you see a little bit of it in, or you hear a little bit about it in uh, Spider-Man. Uh, in Spider-Man, Far, Far From Home, yeah. Yeah, but this is the really the first time where, like, oh no, you see somebody rematerialize from being snapped away. So it, it was very interesting to see that from... I found that from scene to be quite jarring, actually. And, and if anything, I actually thought it did a better job at conveying the chaos than oh, yeah. you say the exposition piece that we got in, in Spider-Man. Sorry, yeah. I think that's the point, is that um, Spider-Man gives us the the upside. Yeah. Yay, right? everybody's the, back. The, 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 the happy ending, but then this is giving us the reality. Oh, yeah. yeah and this, is, it, this it, is more of an existential horror type thing. Well, and well, and that's mean, exactly what it would be. You had a hospital overwhelmed in a, in a fraction of a second. Double the yeah. patients. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least 50% more. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even uh, Captain America references like taking the ferry in New York and seeing seeing fish, you know, oh, yeah, like yeah. not everything is, some things are better. Yeah. Oh my. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, interesting tie-in that actually comes up in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. There are people who thought it was better when the blip was on. That's true. So, yeah. True. But that's beside the point for right now. So we, we, we come in on, on, uh, monica rematerializing and really from there it's just a, a tour de force through you know this is monica she works for sword sword 
is sort of kind of an offshoot of shield where they do you know whatever it is they do and and we walk through her journey from rematerializing finding out her mother's gone yeah. finding out what happened with sword which was uh, a the organization that her mother helped to found that's correct from there she goes we, we uh, meet hayward goes, in this episode right we meet hayward uh interesting point of fact uh the certificates on hayward's wall are in a hex oh interesting um, nice grab something something people didn't notice the first time it took me a couple of times watching it to realize that but they're, they're on when you walk into his office there's a hex right there on the wall oh wow which kind of made me like a lot of people were thinking that hayward was going to be the the manifestation of mephisto which Again, might have been one of those dropped plot lines. Again, I, I will reiterate that Hayward is a new character. He doesn't have a counterpart in the comic universe. Um, he was created specifically, specifically for, for the show. Wanda okay. Yep. We go from there. We end up in, in Westview where we meet the uh, B. Pl- so uh, Monica was like a B or C plot from Captain Marvel, which crashes into the C plot of Jimmy Woo from uh, Ant-Man. Oh, I thought you were going to say Blockbuster Video. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Crashes into Blockbuster Video. Wait, wrong show. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. I'm I'm sticking to I'm sticking to sticking to WandaVision here. Um so so we get Jimmy Woo back and honestly, he's my favorite character in this whole series cuz in, in Uh he's in, completely in, charming in, by the way. He's absolutely charming. Yeah. He's the and new Coulson for me. Yeah, for sure he, he is. is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Um, but we, we find out that he has picked up how to do close-up magic since asking Ant-Man Scott. how he did that. Love that little drop. That's fantastic. <laughs> just just a slight little subtle thing that only people who watch the movies would know about. We get the scene with the Westview police who are holding him at the border of what is... Are they? I thought they the were... Hacks. Are they Westview or are they New Jersey state troopers? I think they're state troopers, but they're... They're on the opposite They're side of the hex. Local police. Yeah. It so, serves. And, it's enough to serve the plot to know that they're local. Aren't they yeah. East View police? East View. Oh, you know Maybe. what, Hank? I think you're right on that. They're East View police. They're the first ones that go, no, no, West View doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. But I they do turn yeah. around and drive back into the hex. Yeah, and then they disappear and then they disappear. That's true, that, actually. That's, that's right. That is weird in, in in terms of that. That is strange. It's, it's kind of like a like a like antivirus. Like they're meeting you at the border, and it's like, no, you can't come in here. Right. So that's kind of how I envisioned it. They're the uh, they're the white blood cells of the hack. Well, this mm, this like, brings up a question then, right? If the if the police were able to just do 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 drive in. Jimmy, as you say, there's this big exposition piece, right? So Jimmy and, and Monica have this big discussion on the edge of the hex. And this is Why where haven't he, you gone in? Because it, it didn't want, want me to. to. You can feel it too, can't you? Yeah. Can't That's you weird. It? So that it's a little weird. weird, but. But at the same I time, mean, if they didn't want Jimmy to go in and Monica basically gets pulled in, does that mean yeah. Wanda was like, okay, you might be able to help me? Subliminally, I don't know. if anything. Yeah. Well, here's here's the thing, and this is my argument: is that the hex is a representative, like she's she's quote unquote in control of it, but I think it's more of a subconscious projection. Like this whole series talks is a lot about like grief and dealing with trauma, and a lot of that kind of thing is rooted in a subconscious, uh, like um, processing of of like. You have to process it consciously, but you also have to process it subconsciously in order to right. truly get over grief. And, you know, anybody who has any any sort of PTSD or um, emotional trauma in their life. Yeah. It rears its ugly head at the most inopportune of times. Sure, sure it does, yeah. And part of the process of getting over those kinds of things is dealing with it both consciously and subconsciously. I maintain that the hex is... Wanda's subconscious protecting her from the psychological damage that she suffered. That, Maybe. That's, that's my opinion. I think there's a subtle hint here that, that is um, indicative of perhaps one of the drop plot lines. And that's that yeah. the hex is still blue. 
Oh. Well, the the hex is blue when it's when it's still trying to blend in when it thinks that nobody is looking at it. Nobody's looking at it. Gotcha. But once it's clear that the hex has been compromised, then it goes, "No, no, do not enter. Red light." Oh, that's you know what I mean? That's possible. It, it, it's another one of those like subconscious camouflage things like is, Until you notice me, I'm going to be unnoticeable. Is there a possibility that this is uh, in the same vein of, it was Agnes, right? I mean, Jimmy Woo, as a as a police officer, is inclined to be a, uh, a, a person of curiosity. And so mm-hmm. is there a possibility that his entering the hex could subvert, uh, there's that word again, could subvert Agnes's motives and she doesn't want Drink. him in there, you know, to, yeah. to lift the veil off of anything that could foil her. Well, then there's here's another thing. I, I think thematically, I'd have to say no thematically because Agnes's powers are purple. And I know well, that I seems think... like a petty thing to hang it on, but there's a definite distinction yeah. uh, between well, blue and red and that they combined make purple. They do. At, with the realization that they dropped a bunch of plot lines and one of them was probably Mephisto, yeah. I think that the cops might have been Mephisto trying to keep people... Away, away while he was manipulating Wanda. I thought that about the beekeeper too. Oh he, yeah, yeah, yeah. If if Hayward and Sword are representative of what Mephisto could have been, then the idea of a cop or an authority figure being a Mephisto creation sure is a little more. It ties it to itself a little more. But regardless, Jimmy's trying to get into town to find a somebody who's in Witsec. He's who's in uh, witness protection. Yep. Uh, which is theorized to be Ralph Boner, but that's never confirmed. So it's another one of those dangling threads that kind of gets hand waved away. No, Ralph. Um, Ralph, who is like so self aware in that episode later on in the episode in the Halloween episode, says surreptitiously to Monica, "You know, yeah, I'm minding my own business, and then I get shot." Yeah. You know, he's he's self aware at that moment. So like. Well, that doesn't mean that he's not that, the guy in witness protection. <laughs> if pe- if bad people are looking for it, getting shot is a, is a completely within the scope well, of being taken out. We we can talk about it when we get to that episode, but I think that's more indicative of Quicksilver's memories being put into. Oh, there's that too. Ralph Boner, because I mean, Quicksilver I think Boner got shot. is actually a reference to the actor's name Peters. You know, it's just <laughs> a penis reference. Penis <laughs> reference. <laughs> Honestly, I don't think that's a drop ball at all, and I think you're going to strongly see the the X Men multiverse merge with the uh, the MCU. Yeah. Current. I definitely so want anyways. to talk about that, but <laughs> take it back, Eric. Take it back before we go off the rails. Yeah, we're back. We're back. So <laughs> Jimmy and uh, Monica meet, and they do their, you know, they do their little passage of information, and uh, we get to a point. Uh, I believe the next beat is where Monica gets sucked in. Yes. Correct? Yes. There's yeah. not much in between that. No, no, not really. So Monica gets sucked in and starts having her experiences within the hex, but we stay outside where Jimmy brings in the cavalry. And this is where we, we get the circus of uh, the circus of military set up where Sh- Sh- sword comes in and they start bringing in experts. And we meet the C plot of Thor, the dark world. Uh, Darcy comes back. Sure. And in the process, no of longer a to... research assistant. Now she's a full on doctorate. Now she's graduated. Yep. Taking her time to get through school. And, uh, now she's a doctor. Does anybody of, remember uh, what I... her, her PhD is in? I did not write it. Down. Me neither. I, it down. <laughs> I don't even remember what it is. She's it's a got PhD. something to do with physics. PhD in plot armor. Astrophysics. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Um, so through the process of, of you know, setting up and, and looking and tinkering, she basically walks in and immediately goes, oh, hey, look at this thing that nobody else realized. And we find out that the hex is giving off what amounts to the background radiation of the Big Bang, which is what sort of keys us into the fact that Wanda may be more than she thought she was. Agreed. So if we go back all the way to Guardians of the Galaxy, where the Collector tells us that the uh, the runoff of the energies of the Big Bang created the Infinity Stones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. And the Infinity Stones are what unlocked 
Wanda's powers, we're kind of getting into sort of a causal loop where because the Infinity Stones interacted with Wanda, her powers started interacting with the energy that the Infinity Stones were created. It's a very cyclical kind of logic. But yeah. we find out that there's no way that this is being caused by anything other than something crazy huge. Background radiation of the Big Bang. That's 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 big. Yeah, it sort of moves Wanda from uh, witch and mutant to cosmic level powers in the Marvel yeah, Universe. Yeah, doesn't it though? Yes, which in my next episode I have some insight on but that'll be later we can um, we can take a second though and talk about infinity stones and <laughs> and uh that even though the space stone is displaced with loki and the mind stone is well they're all they've all been sent back to wherever cap took them back to to their places in time they still exist on a molecular level. yeah they still exist so you can't so, yeah. help but have that that influence i guess on some level so what it they did the unblip and then they sent them all back to where they belonged in the timeline ostensibly That's right. except for what happened to the, the space, space stone, stone. which yeah. is gonna which is explained. part of the reason the multiverse theory is going to come to fruition but that's a whole other show yeah it's loki uh, it's it's called loki it starts in a couple of months that's right <laughs> um <laughs> but basically what it what it comes down to is that the stones have been atomized by thanos but what made them up is still around. So they're not gone. They're just well, I mean, no longer the, uh, in play. We could talk about the Ancient One and Doctor Strange talking about these uh, branch timelines. You have to imagine that they exist in every branch timeline on some level. So do they yeah. exist in multiple realities at the same time? Or are there mm-hmm. copies of them? So... Who knows? Bigger question, though. A bigger question <laughs> that requires a deeper answer than what I can provide sitting here. <laughs> I don't know. I found that so, whole explanation to be a giant plot hole. Yeah, that's a, it, the whole it, branch realities. Like, you remove one piece and it screws up everything. Well, they removed some pretty big pieces. They and... sure did. Well, there's Another there's a little, bit of clo- a little bit of closure to that in Episode 9 of WandaVision, which, again, we'll get to. Okay. So here, Darcy comes in as Captain Exposition and picks out picks out the Deus Ex Machina in the, and and shows. Oh no, there's a there's a television signal in here. I need a TV, an old one, like not flat. So at this point, we learn that this is back in time before the first episode, because when they tune in, it is the first episode of One Division that they start watching when they finally yeah, figure right. out yeah. how to tune in. I feel like it's weird so, that uh, in 20, so uh, uh, Avengers timeline, we're talking, what, 2023? Is that right? Uh, 2020 something, yes. At least. That broadcast television, is it not still on the VHF and the UHF bands? <laughs> you know, it, it hasn't changed since the advent of broadcast television. Because that's one other well, thing. They have to get a 50s no, period it's... TV to pick up that. Yeah, first signal. like I guess well, when uh, think about your TV right now, it's all it's all internet based. Right, but at the same time, it's I can digital. still the bandwidths don't disappear. This is what I mean. Broadcast like, across them, right? I yeah. could There's still all kinds put of empty up bandwidth out there. It could still put up a uh, an old tuner tower with a with a rotor on top, and I could still pick and up... harness the bandwidth. That's what yeah, I mean. That's all so, you're really doing. Yeah. is it really a big revelation that? <laughs> You know, there's a TV so, signal. Well, if you ask kids these days, you know, for their phones, Fair they're not enough. going to use the phone symbol that we're familiar with. So culturally, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. But you got you got to realize that young people don't know how old TVs work. Oh, fair enough. So this is their way of dumbing it down for, you know, get out of my lawn. Plot armor. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so I told you she's got a PhD in plot is, armor, and there it is. <laughs> this is where this is where we see that scene from the first episode where you see all the disparate aged pieces of technology on the same screen. This is where they start building that. Yeah, like a period TV for every episode. Yeah, exactly. Cool. And they start pulling out, you know, screen captures and pictures and doing facial recognition, and they start putting identities to these people who are within Westview. Oh, that's uh, right. Yeah, yeah. The first TV had a Stark logo on it. 
Yeah, it did. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So Herb's real name is revealed to be John Collins. Yeah. And Mrs. Hart, the, who uh, we had said was um, Kitty Foreman. Deborah Jo Rupp. That's correct. Uh, her real name is revealed to be Sharon Davis. And again, this these are the names of two of the show's art directors. Oh, cool. So they're continuing that through line of putting their crew, like little nods to them, into the show. I'm not going to lie. Um, when this came up and they were starting to like lay this out, I was jogged back to our review episodes of The Mandalorian with the prison registry. And I kept yep. looking for, <laughs> do these people have significance in the greater Marvel universe? Yeah. Well, it was There's kind a lot of, a, of there, there was a lot of that. It was a bit of a disappointment. <laughs> I combed through all of those names, and I was like, "Is this person a hidden superhero? Yeah. Going to be in the next? Is this person?" Turns out, no. Yeah, uh, I was also looking for the Grim Reaper, but couldn't find him. So we get we get background information on who these characters actually are, and suspiciously, Agnes's real name is just a question mark because they can't find her yeah she doesn't exist uh, so, as a resident yeah this is another hint that agnes <clears throat> doesn't quite fit into the same scale right. as the rest of the characters you you still pause it and read the bios and stuff there's a little piece of information on norms it doesn't happen until the next episode and yeah so that was a this... that was an accident they, they revealed that that was a, oh really was an accidental i thought it was just showing error. us that the time was skewed Oh, no, it's because they shot it out of order. Oh, okay. Oh, right. That makes sense. I didn't sense. catch yeah, that. It, I, just, it was I actually a, thought it was, it was a, a production accident. Oh, really? I thought it was intentional. It seems intentional to, to show how time is skewing. And you know what? It does feel like it could have been intentional. It so could work on that entirely level. out of place. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll, I'll, I'll step on it when we get to the episode call, five. Call it a happy accident. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> we, see, we see a whiteboard with a whole bunch of suggestions of how this could have happened. Yeah. With... Uh, Jimmy Wu having a big old scrolls question mark. Yeah, yeah, I did see that. Which again, like dun, I said, dun, this dun. is tying in all of the MCU. So there's things on there like all kinds of different explanations from the movies that tie into how this could Yeah, happen. sure, sure, sure. So we get a lot of that. Uh we see this is getting towards the end of the episode anyway. This, I guess we'll just go to that. Is this the episode where Hayward reveals the uh, the Endgame post credit scene that got dropped? Wanda going to visit the body. I don't think Is that so. this episode? It's not this episode. Okay. Mm. No, that happens after Monica comes back out. Okay. Because Monica is part of Oh, the right. She's still inside the anomaly. Sorry, my mistake. Yeah. Yeah, because at the end of this episode, that's what happens. The, the hex starts acting up. And Monica, Monica gets, gets spit out flung back into reality in her you know hippie pants and the last thing we hear is it's wanda it's all wanda it's all wanda true yeah so this really was the don't worry it's still marvel episode this is yep. this i think is if you weren't hooked by episode three already which most of us were yeah totally and you got and you got to episode four it's shot in the Marvel movie style. There's no three camera. There's no, there's no audience. There's no canned laughter. It's shot like a Marvel movie. So yeah, it's full uh, full widescreen too. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. No, I, I can't argue with you on any of that. That's uh, totally it's totally true. Which is why I'm glad I sniped it. Um, so there, there are again a lot of Easter eggs in this one. To hit on a couple of the, uh, couple of them, as Monica's rematerializing at the beginning of the episode, we can hear Carol Danvers saying her nickname, Lieutenant Trouble. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can actually hear it in the mix there. Yeah. Uh, which is just a reminder to like, oh, she's related to Captain Marvel. Aunt Ooh. Carol. Yep. Uh, Monica wakes up from the blip in room 104 which doesn't have any significance to her or captain marvel's history no but uh avengers number 104 is a story about the avengers and the x-men teaming up to fight uh a mut mutant hunting sentinels who have strapped wanda to a, a machine that will cause a solar flare sterilizing humans and allowing the mutation gene to be bred out uh, dun, dun, so dun. 
there's a link there to Wanda. It's a very tenuous link, but it's mm-hmm. it's there. It's That's the only good. number thing that I ever caught. Well, hey, if that doesn't play into the whole, like, are we introducing mutants in this show, then I don't know what is. <laughs> oh, th- this this whole show has so many, like, uh, mutants, question mark? Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I've got lots to say <laughs> about that in my next one. <laughs> I wanted I want to point out that the sword color scheme yeah is a uh, a blue black and white yeah which is a big old tease to the Fantastic 4 Even especially the, yep. <laughs> because Hayward and Monica have a conversation about an astronaut training program that's not doing too well yeah yeah there's a first oh, indication spot right? on sir even down oh, to the just, sword, the sword symbol yeah. being in the center of the chest, the suit, like before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The colors I can't of the argue uniform. with that. Yeah, there's it's, another. It's just so tantalizing. Yeah. I have another one that like uh, doubles down on that in the next episode. Actually, or great, Fantastic Four. Yeah, there was one more thing. Uh, the beekeeper was referred to as Agent Franklin, mm-hmm. which nice. Franklin Richards could be. Um, nice nod to that that was yeah you know, just just little tiny things that are that are keyed in here and there that's pretty much it as far as far as the big ones that i yeah. wanted to mention this is the one that i referred um, to as the this is the payoff episode because if you were subverted in episodes one and two this is the one that you finally kind of went oh it, this makes this sense now the, <laughs> this is the no really you have to watch this show yeah episode. yeah yeah this is the ned stark getting his head chopped off like oh <laughs> yeah yeah i guess so eh? <laughs> <laughs> uh the last thing was uh at the end credits uh the song playing is voodoo child by Jimi hendrix nice uh and the lyrics to that uh just to pick out some of the main lyrics that are pertinent here uh i stand up next to a mountain mount wundagor Oh yeah. Uh, I pick up all the pieces and make an island. I make myself an island. So Westview. The hex is Westview. It's yeah. A little island of yep. humanity. Uh, there's one more. Uh, I don't mean to take up all your sweet time, which you know she's got all these people trapped. They they and forcing them to spend their time on her trauma. Yeah. Lord knows I'm a voodoo child. Yep. Scarlet Witch, and then well, I mean, voodoo, the, like, voodoo. You <laughs> can't, you can't make a joke. And I mean, I've said it a million times: voodoo witchcraft. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and then finally, right here at the bottom, I don't take no for an answer. Right. So this is at least the second time that they've snuck in one of these really kind of poignant songs to the credits. So yeah, that was that was really cool to to notice. And that's that's about it for me. It was. It was pretty straightforward, all exposition, very little fluff. And yet, I I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was oh, delighted. Yeah, I was delighted to see Darcy Lewis come back. Uh, yeah. To know that, oh, that's who's sitting there watching the whole time. I loved, you know, the development with Jimmy that he's now this, as you say, the new uh, the new Coulson, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, he's not just a. Uh, second rate comic relief character that he was relegated to in the course of Ant-Man and the Wasp. No, he's great. Yeah. 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 Big time. I kind of enjoy the way that they're starting to watch the, the Wanda vision show in world. They're watching it like we are. Yeah. Agnes, (laughs) Agnes was barely present in this, in this episode. It's true. She's barely even showed up. No, that, that Um, is true. Yeah. Very true. We we get another glimpse of Vision's caved in head. Um, yeah, that was a little jarring. Yeah, was not expect. No, which still, and, it, along the the lines of the whole subversiveness of the show, was enough to keep me guessing: is it really the Vision body just animated like a zombie? That would yeah, I thought that right up until the reveal. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And the most visceral sort of images that pop out of trauma. A big time, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, that you know those things that just won't go away, but you suppress them. But that's one of the that's one of hers, you know. That yeah, the harder you clamp down on that stuff, the harder it pushes back. Right. Yeah. yeah and it yeah. pops up at an opportunity. As you say, so. yeah, exactly, exactly. There's a story I heard from. Oh no, wait, hang on. 
this might be your story, Wes, so I probably shouldn't share it. <laughs> uh, you, the, you told the me names, you told the names me and places and have been sure changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> well, yeah. it depends on what it is, really, um, I guess. Well, it's the story about the plastic bag on the highway. Oh yeah, that's a uh, that gets me every time. Or like uh, yeah. other, I I've actually had this conversation with both Andy and Hank about about garbage on the road and how it can be a trigger. <laughs> yeah. Well, just if if you want, are are you okay if I tell this story? Oh uh, yeah, sure, it's sure. Just, Go ahead. It's just a little. You told me a story about how you drove over a plastic bag and yep. it made a whomp sound. Yep. And that just sort of set you off, and you had to pull off to the side of the road and, yeah. and kind of deal with it. Yep this image of vision's caved in skull it's very uncomfortable and and it, it sort of plays in it it shocks us as the audience and it shocks wanda in continuity and it's it's sort of a representation of how those kind of traumatic issues pop up when you don't want them to or when you're when you're in a vulnerable moment yeah um, there's no predicting when that stuff's going to come up uh for people who who struggle with those things yeah i mean you, you told me the story earlier on uh, in our relationship about how you you, you ran over a, a plastic bag yeah and you got that ex- explosive decompression of air yeah yeah the concussive bang yeah and just the sound kind of you had to you had to take some time and and deal with that and and i'm happy that you shared that with me because I've, I've had experiences similar to that not as not yeah as vivid, but again i mean from I, a from from uh speaking from the perspective of a of a trauma and i don't want to say victim but uh, someone who's experienced trauma like that like there's no uh, quite often there's no rhyme or reason to when it comes up but like i i had alluded to before like the tighter you clamp down on that stuff the harder it can push back against you. So like metaphorically speaking, as it pertains to the show, it's a good indicator that she is still very much, you know, using the the 12 step analogy, she's still very much trying to push it down and to squash it and, and still trying to be in control, but you're not going to be in control until you've, you've come to terms and processed it. And she clearly hasn't done that at this point. Yeah. There's still a little bit of like bargaining going on and, yeah, yeah. and whatnot. And and this is just a moment where she's just expelled someone from her illusion. Right. She's feeling vulnerable. She's having a moment. Her concentration's a little broken. Right. And Vision walks in and she's reminded, oh yeah, Ultron did kill him. So, that's right. And that's kind of all I really wanted to touch on for, for episode four. Okay. It's very much the most self-explanatory episode if you watch it yeah there's really nothing we need to analyze except for the the easter eggs <laughs> everything else is really upfront and readily available for anyone yeah. who watches it yeah yeah episode uh five on a very special episode right <laughs> back to the tv trope yeah right from the right from the top though you guys remember and i don't i don't know eric if uh TV still did this sort of thing, but in the eighties, it was super common to have an advertisement before an episode of a very special episode of different strokes yeah, oh yeah, or mm-hmm. a very special episode of family ties. And these episodes would always be about something horrible happening, like a death mm-hmm. of a main character or drug use or abortion or, you know, something just crazy. Like, really you know, there, there was yeah, a, something that a different was strokes definitely, episode uh... about the bike shop and the, the child molester. Like, right. So <laughs> right away, if you're, if you're steeped in that sort of 80s comic tr- or uh, TV trope, this episode, something bad's about to happen. In this well, episode. not even right. just comic trope. So just to, just to derail for a second here, my first recollection of one of these was watching an old episode of uh, Mr. Rogers. Sure. He, he did an oh, episode with on the mailman. Death oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the the one with the mailman too, uh, the racism episode. But the, the one I remember is the, he did an episode on death. And, sure. And that was that was something that my little my little child noodle couldn't deal with really. Yeah, I'm totally reminded of the uh, watching Big Bird go through Mister Hooper's death on Sesame Street. Oh, or, right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. And how he was basically our little child catharsis we watched him deal with it and it informed us how we should deal with it but i don't like it it makes me sad or that it could be dealt with could be dealt with yeah 
Yeah. So directed by Matt Shackman again. Uh, he's carried a big load on this series so far. Uh, right? He's directed every episode. He was yeah, continuous absolutely. throughout. Written by Peter Cameron and Mackenzie Dore. I didn't find anything of note that they did. I'm sorry, guys. I can touch uh, on Peter Cameron because he comes up for my next episode. So Peter Cameron, get this. 16 episodes of the Amazon Prime series Carnival Row. And I say 16 with some emphasis because only eight of those have aired so far. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a great show if you haven't seen it. It's, uh, I haven't. That's kind of why I didn't include it because it's it, a, I wasn't familiar with it. It's basically, it takes some of the fantasy tropes of like fey creatures and okay. basically drops them into Victorian England. I'll have to tell my wife. About it's it. pretty she's, cool. She's right up her yeah, alley. Yeah, super cool. So air date February 5th, 2021. My episode synopsis in the style of 80s sitcoms, such as Family Ties, Growing Pains, Full House, and Roseanne, Wanda and Vision struggle with parenthood while Agnes seems to have all the answers. Outside the hex, sword director Hayward searches for ways to breach Wanda's reality. Yeah. So I kind of did more of a sort of a, a brief synopsis, and it kind of captures the whole, like a lot of the, the different things. Like it starts out like Wanda and... Vision can't get the infants to stop crying. No. Nope. And um, we've we've definitely moved heavily into the 80s. We're back into the, the TV trope. And this is sort of where you get the, in the, uh, well, well, first we'll deal with uh, Agnes arrives and she seems to have all the answers. She's, she's certainly saying, let me try to rock the children. And Wanda is like all on board. And then, then a weird thing happens where, Vision analyzes that real quickly. He's like, well, you could do that, but if you didn't, if something went wrong and it, so maybe, maybe not. Actually, you know what? You would just maybe be better not. It appears that he's just like an overprotective parent. He's analyzing the situation heavily. And something so strange happens there is what happens is Vision's responses aren't in the script. No, so no, Agnes, they aren't. Agnes, like an actress stepping out of character, asks Wanda for a cue. Do you want to take that again? Should we just take it from the top? Yeah. <laughs> and nice. Wanda's like, oh, no, 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 no. Like, she suppresses what just happened there. But Vision right. can't. What was that about? What was what? No. Oh, oh, sorry. This is bringing up something that I totally forgot. Sure. We When, when we're watching Darcy watch the episodes, we yeah. see one of those cuts. And it's oh, a that's hard right. cut. That's right, yeah. And it, it only shows you what the Wanda re, wants The to rewind. See. Yeah. So this right. is another one of those situations. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Wanda just brushes it off, but it's like, it's immensely disturbing to Vision. He's like, did you, did you not just see what she did there? Did you really not see what I saw? You know, but, but then we're back on, we're back in the script. We're back to where, no, Agnes is definitely going to sprinkle some magic potion on the children. Sure. It's supposed to have a calming effect. And they magically age five years. Yeah, yeah. So, do, do we think that Agnes did that? The the fairy dust thing? I mean, she's definitely, well, <laughs> she's got the magic potion. She references a, a strong sexual reference to Ralph pouring that on her to make her oh, yeah, yeah. do his bidding. So this, again, if there's if there's a higher, higher power, because like right now, I would say Agnes is the higher power, the the, the puppeteer. Right. But I still think that there is a... a an argument to be made for someone is pulling her strings. It's not Agnes's fault that she has an unusually high libido. I it's just true. thought it was just, I just thought it was an inappropriate reference to how um back in the day if a kid wouldn't go to sleep you'd just give him a little bit of whiskey. Oh, there is that too. Or, but, <laughs> that was what they, I pulled out of that. That's the second reference because she says, "Do you have any dark liquor here?" But before the dark <laughs> liquor reference, she's sprinkling she says, "This is my magic potion that Ralph gave me or something like that." Yeah. So there's there's sort of two references to that that trope, you know. Ny Nyquil. What kind of babysitter do you think I am? Right, exactly. <laughs> and then uh, she's, you know, they said she's like, "Don't worry, I'm not going to drink it. I'm not that kind of babysitter." But then she's l sitting on the counter, you know, she's always like the Cheshire cat. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah. She's in weird poses and She's acting the trope, but she's not. Her body language is different. Right. And she's clearly drinking the dark liquor that she promised she, that just she wasn't seconds going ago, to. She yeah. wasn't going to drink. The themes I mean, in that's... this are Wanda trying to take control as things get way out of hand. They, things are getting bigger. Right. Her sphere of influence has grown so big that she can't control it all the time. Uh, yep. Vision increasingly begins to question reality in terms of this reality. 
and the color red is just just so prevalent in this episode it's it's insane there's a question to be asked of do wanda's powers not work on the kids because they have their own powers and it's it's it doesn't like they're not mixing properly well and or this is, is where subconsciously holding back from doing anything to do, children do wanda's so powers that, not work on the kids because they're a direct manifestation of mephisto and that's where i dive way back into the comics yeah and that's why i was just so like i know what's going on exactly <laughs> is everybody crazy because well, in the comics as you guys know or may not know th- th- her children are shards of mephisto's soul right <laughs> and agatha harkness wants to keep him from being whole so she's protecting Wanda's children ostensibly or using them for her own powerful gains. Yeah. Um, that direct link to Mephisto, that the, the fact that these aren't hers, that they were created for her, even though, you know, there's the moments there where yeah, like the, the pregnancy being so accelerated, the, the, the aging of the children, like, to, right. you know, if, if they're shards of Mephisto's soul, or if they have some amount of his power or autonomy or ascensions, She's literally got to beg them at one point not to age. Like yep. they have control over that. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. I, w- I want to point out something that comes up a little later. It's revealed that the Scarlet Witch uses chaos magic. Yes. And there's something to be said that children are little sources of chaos that we gradually <laughs> impose order onto over the course of their lives. Sure. So maybe that's why her magic doesn't work on them because children, chaos, chaos magic. I just came up with that just now. So. Oh, it's perfectly relevant. So I did agree. we, uh, I what do we get right? Like what, did, what, did, what were some of the take homes from this? Uh, so this episode does a fantastic job at emulating like if, right from the get go from the, the, the paintbrush and painting the picture at the opening credits. I'm like, Oh, it's family ties. And I was so, I loved family ties. Like I grew Absolutely. up, I grew up on Alex P. Keaton. So, uh, Alex P. Keaton. I just loved this episode for what it tried yeah. to be visually. It was, it was just, it was right where I would expect it to be if you're trying to emulate a Family Ties episode. <laughs> yeah, and they they went through the uh, the age the pictures that, uh, in that opening scene the, the way yeah. the pictures the characters age is is growing pains. Then there's there's the biggest meta reference that you could probably make is the scene where the family runs across the lawn is right from the opening sequence of, of Full House. The Full House bit, yeah. And now we're getting meta, meta, meta. Because her obviously her sisters are the famous you know twins that portrayed the Michelle on the show. And- there's a there's a scene in this episode where Wanda is wearing uh, her outfit. It, it consists of like a it's a multicolored sweater, and she's got right. like an off centered top knot. And I'm like, she's exactly she is totally her sisters in this yes. episode. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Oh, it was so um, good. Yeah, I mean. They use trope again perfectly. Like the acting is, Drink. you know, it's more in you know, in uh, line with the '80s shows. Uh, like the, there's a darker tone. So where, yeah. and then we get to the part that why this is a very special episode because we're going to start to deal with death. So they deal with death, at the death of uh, Scruffy. Is it Scruffy? Sparky. 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 Sparky my bad. Dog, Sparky. Yeah. Sparky is actually the name of Vision's dog in comic. That's right. Yeah. Yep. And they both die the same way. They eat poison flowers. Mm-hmm. it's it the way like that this. she talks about this, the scene, you know, they're begging her to change reality, like suggesting that they have some, some higher knowledge of power. her ability to manipulate things. Right. Yeah. Right. And then she's explaining to them why you can't bring back the dead, right? Like there's certain rules you can't break. She's got a backpedal here because she's breaking rules. Right. Yeah. But there's a weird moment when, I think it's the first sort of crack in Agnes that we see because they say, can you please just, just change death? And she's like, no, I yeah, can't that's do that. right. Yeah, yeah. But Agnes goes, you can really? do that right yeah, out of character. Yeah, yeah, she's yeah, not, yeah. A, she, she's right out of character there. You yeah, can do she that. Is. And yeah. so, you know, the way they view maybe her, th- their father, you know, being brought back. I, I don't know how much meta knowledge they have in yeah. terms of the universe, but certainly this is what starts the, the Pedro wheels sort well, of I mean, cooking. Well, I mean, uh, 
the knock on the door at the end of the episode is, you know, totally. <laughs> and so just on that for Eric, I know you had something you wanted to say and I'll, I'll yeah, no, we'll I get can hold there. on to it. At the knock at the door moment, when the door opens and we get the, sh- the shot of Pietro from behind, right up until the camera spun around, I was convinced that that was Aaron Taylor Johnson. The hair was perfect. The mm-hmm. the the bot. There's no body language. You guys just standing there. But then, yeah, the big reveal of, <gasps> and hence the 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 title of the episode on a very special episode, right? Yeah, the, the introduction. She of... recast Pietro. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That meta that that sort of statement right there is what is how you and I react. That's how, that's how a fan reacts. And she's, right. She's not the scientist in charge of researching this project at the moment. She's no, like she's someone who's watching her favorite show. show and they've just recast a main character. What yeah. the frick? Yeah, right? exactly. And this, I, is, uh, this is Aunt Viv all over again. Oh certainly yeah, for yeah, me, yeah. And I don't want to step on anybody's like preference toes here, but for me, Evan Peters is the way better Quicksilver. Uh, certainly well, he the, also has more screen time and i don't know if it's just because they gave him cooler things to do that that i think so that time in a bottle scene is classic both of um, those both uh, both of his uh his speed sequences in both films were played to you know perfection for what they're intended to be yeah um, and i felt like he was just more like the jokey kind of pestery yeah, yeah he just yeah, had yeah. that energy about him and 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 quicksilver from the the avengers movie seemed very more brooding uber serious yeah and more brooding yeah and we we have had both versions in the comics i mean it lights up and so many questions though you know what i mean it does there's so so many meta nods in that like yes they did recast pietro but it's the other pietro that we know exists from that's the right other, yeah the other company universe <laughs> yeah which we know yeah. that even more oh. meta we know that beyond like even the, our universe that that a corporation controlling what's who's making the show has also acquired that property yeah so they can now freely use that information within their property and give us Met- this level of meta that they're watching on their tv <laughs> like bro it's, it's meta all the way down turtles and turtles so without getting into the ramifications of of who the character is having evan peters though show up it was icing on the cake like they didn't you know just get some yeah. other actor no to put on some white hair and show up and, and be pietro and, and still have the same effect within the show no they went right to evan peters and again the actual other the, pietro right so the subversiveness of the show like Drink. holy shit did we just pull mutants into the mcu in one fell swoop which is yeah, kind of what I thought yeah. they did. They better have still. <laughs> yeah. I think they're still building to that. And that, I think they that better comes have later still. in episode nine. Easter eggs, guys. I went kind of deep here. Sure. Well, uh, beyond Pietro, sure. What do you got? Vision references Darwin's Descent of Man. Yeah. Book about human reproduction and the role that women play in choosing a mate. Oh. And then it's all about Wanda creating her own reality to have children. Right. It's very interesting to me that this whole series kind of just expands on Vision is this sort of warrior philosopher. Right. Yeah, I love it. Because he keeps pull he pulls out Shakespeare references and mm-hmm. and later on there's there's a reference to um the boat of uh Theseus. That's right, Theseus, yeah. That's in episode and nine, yeah. Is it Theseus? Yep. Yes, uh, I, I think so. But but he keeps pulling out these obscure references, and then there's the famous line which comes in episode eight that caused all the controversy. And he he's very like he's pushing these philosophical ideas, and then you're realizing that this vision is a construct of Wanda's subconscious memories, feelings, and perhaps mind stone connection Mm -hmm. to what vision was and it's getting like is this her subconscious pushing its philosophies onto her conscience or it like it's very mind bendy it's really mind you eric you had already alluded to the cyclical nature of the whole thing with with infinity stones and let's just talk about that for a second where um oh what was the commercial in this one uh, logos Logos both characters both Wanda and Vision uh, are, on some level, are byproducts of the same stone. So That's right. when you talk about is it Wanda's subconscious being projected into the Vision? How about is it actually Vision? What is what was left of Vision 
transferred into her, her. now yeah. being retransmitted back to her projection. Like true. you want to talk about meta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Vision has pacifiers stuck in his ears. Yeah. So cute. joke, but you know what else it is? It's a reference to the original Frankenstein movie. Oh, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. also a the reference to the way that Vision of, yeah. in the Age of Ultron, it's how Vision talks about, he references, am I a monster? Well, this is it. So this is where I was going. And brought to life with Thor's lightning. This is where I was going with it, that oh, whole yeah. idea of right from his birth in Age of Ultron, when he's talking at the party to, I guess not at the party's over now, they've cleaned up and they're actually having this discussion about what he is you can't tell me that he's not all philosophical right from the get-go oh hell yeah this is why i say this is why i say is there an actual portion of vision within wanda because of the link uh to the mind stone he says in this scene you know maybe we don't understand the children yet maybe we just need more time which is another reference to time yeah you start to realize every character in the show (laughs) is wearing a watch that's not something i would have picked up on Jesus. So you got to go walk, but you got to go back and check it out. But, or That's in every very scene, subtle. there's a clock on the wall or a timepiece or an hourglass in yeah. almost every scene. And I think it's, it, it means that we're, we're starting to wind down the show, the season, and the time is running out. Interesting. Time is super important. Yeah. Yeah. They, you know, we're speeding up, we're catching up to reality. Right. And so maybe it's indicative that Wanda's time of control is almost up. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, Agnes continues to reference her husband Ralph, but I I found it to be like the sitcom references to characters that don't exist or never appear on screen. So like Lilith and Fraser, right? Or Norm's yeah. wife from Cheers. Yeah. Or yeah. Uh, the uh, ugly naked guy from Friends. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. Ralph, he's yeah, always in the yeah. background. Or ambiguous. I know it's this is a little different, but I mean. Uh... What's the neighbor's name in Home Improvement? Like he's he's Wilson. there, yeah. Norm. So Wilson, Wilson over the or fence, Wilson, yeah. right? He's just a right. pair of eyes. That's Do right. you know what I mean? Like so, I mean, sort of the same yeah. idea for sure. Yeah, yeah. In the uh, in the opening credit scene, there's a, there's a shot of Vision at a chalkboard, right? And it might be nothing, but there's a an infinity symbol that he's written on the chalkboard, and there's yeah. also a, a diagram that's the standard sort of scientific diagram for a wormhole. Uh. Both those things. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, outside, when Monica awakens out of the hex, she said that she heard Wanda's voice in her head saying trust. Oh. It's very subtle. It's almost dry. You, you, I had to watch it a few yeah. times to figure out what the word she said was. It was trust. Okay. It comes up again when Wanda drags the drone out of the hex. That's right. She's, yeah. wear, she's wearing her uh, Endgame outfit still. Yes, yeah, she is. Right? Yeah. And uh, Well, she, in theory, she... she had just rematerialized before she came here. Well, this is it. It, I think if yeah. uh, for to even step meta, I think in, in their timeline that this show is three weeks after the blip. Yeah. Yeah. And, I had to go uh, looking for that, but that's what yeah. I came up with as well. Yeah. And so there's a few things here because Monica references the fact that you must have trusted me in terms of what she heard Wanda say in her head. You must have trusted me to let yeah. you in on some level. You let me you let me help you give birth to your children. On yeah. some level, you know I'm not here to hurt you. Yeah. One of my favorite Easter eggs here is, and I know that we're we've gone a different direction for for Wanda and Pietro in in this universe, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Is that we grew up with Magneto being their father? Yes. And in this scene, when she mind controls everybody to point their guns at Director Haywood, yeah, it's very reminiscent of the opening scene from. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, Ian McKellen. The X-Men where Magneto causes all the troops to turn their guns on using, you know? I I was like, yeah, wow, yeah. actually. Yeah. That could be a uh, a nod to the franchise. It could be. It could be. Hayward mentions a Lagos, uh which is the country that she lost control of her powers and she wiped out that friggin' office building, killed all those innocent people. Yes, that's right. Yeah. When they were Later chasing on, we got, uh, crossbones. Crossbones. Yeah. Later yeah. on, we get the commercial, and this steps back into our 12-step program and stuff. So in the commercial for Lagos Paper Towels, one of the kids spills red liquid all over the all over the counter. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. She's got blood on her hands. Indicative of, of blood, yeah, for sure. Right, and the ether, yeah, right, and her yeah. powers, right? And that, just like this, the trope commercial, it can't be picked up with a regular paper towel. It just spreads it everywhere. No, you're right. You, yeah. you need Lagos paper towels. Lagos is, again, the country that, that's right. where the sin was committed. Yeah, yeah, where yeah. Where she got the blood on her hands. 
Which, yeah. And I think that's the, heavy. The that's root root of the really Sokovia heavy. Chords. And also it's it's the the space ooze stone, if you will. So yeah. each commercial is a separate infinity stone. The um, slogan for Lago Spray and Paper Towels, the mess yeah. you didn't mean to. A mess, yeah, that's yeah, right. You didn't the mess to. you didn't mean to. Yes, exactly. Uh, Darcy name drops Father Knows Best, and she calls she calls Vision a vibranium synthesoid. So that's the, that's the Marvel sort of word, the Marvel Comics word for that's him. That's right, synthesoid. He's yeah. a synthetic man. That's he's right. He's not an android. He's a synthetic man. Yeah. Uh, so that's the first time we kind of get that. Wasn't the original Human Torch a, a synthesoid? Yes. That's Absolutely. the body yes. he was based on. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's yes. right. Yeah. Vision was built from the original Human Torch, the first Vision. This, this was one, what I was talking about earlier, the, the newspaper references. Right. So this particular newspaper, this is when I started to notice it, went back and found a whole bunch more. There's like an ad for, what does it say here? Sorry, guys. Motherhood, local homemaker innovates recipes. So <laughs> essentially, Wanda warps reality to create children. And on the back, there's a there's an ad, and Envision's holding the paper. And that's the headline of the paper, by the way. Sorry, sure. I didn't mean to just read that out of context. The could headline it, of the paper is... Could it also be uh, a callback to using her powers to make fucking breakfast for dinner? Certainly. <laughs> certainly. And on the back is an ad for... Recipes? Buy this TV. And it's it's the TV that Darcy's watching. Oh, yeah, on. yeah. But in every single newspaper, there's a reference to womanhood or motherhood or some sort of... right headline and on the back there's an ad for a tv or a radio or something like that i think back to the first episode because i was i was looking at that stuff too and they agnes comes back with the uh because she she spends a lot of time in the first episode talking about impress your man and then she yes. comes back with essentially their the west view or the the wandavision version of cosmo and you don't really get a good look at what she's reading like the the questionnaire but the back of the the magazine is all about you know impressing your man. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Like, exactly. Is that another reference? She's reading to... the magazine Glamorous. The, yeah, that's what several it's times yeah. it's called Glamorous. That's and it, it always has a woman dressed in red on the cover, and uh, except the black and white version. Yeah. So uh, okay. Monica's standing in front of a whiteboard with all kinds of crazy math on it. She references a neural space engineer who might be up for a challenge at helping mm, decipher. Not this. really sure who we're talking about there. Is that our know. second shot at the Fantastic Four? And I believe that it is. And I believe yeah, that neural I think space that's another. That's Reed another Richards. one of those. It's another one of those dropped. Yeah. Sort of. Can we call that? I I put in a line when I was kind of putting together the format I wanted to use. I I put in a mm. line for missed opportunities. Can yes. we can we call that a missed opportunity? We don't know yet, though. It could be the long con. I guess so. It yeah, could, it's still it could still be resolved. Like we might get Reed Richards. There is one other person one that movies. is. I think that's only a matter of time. That it could be. Who's that? That would be uh, Adam Brashear, also known as the Blue Marvel. Oh yeah. He, he, uh, he's he's a character with a more oh, yeah. a slightly more direct. Uh, There's a lot of people that it could Monica be Monica Rambo. Yes. I mean, on some level, you uh, talk about the most brilliant minds of the Marvel Universe, and immediately I'm like, could we get a cameo from Mark Ruffalo? You know, I mean, I know his stuff is Gamma, but at the same time, he's still a brilliant scientist who's consulted on a lot of stuff. For me, it's the neurospace engineer. Yeah, the neuro neurospace. What about... Uh, neurospace engineer. <laughs> what's the kid's name? Amadeus Cho? Yes. So that's mm-hmm. another one that I go to, you know, like yeah. it's oh the all new all new awesome Hulk, yeah, the totally awesome yeah. Hulk, yeah, yeah the totally awesome, awesome Hulk. But yeah. he was Amadeus Cho long yeah. before he was the Hulk, yeah, and he was yes. already, mm-hmm. I mean, the Doogie Howser of the Marvel universe, right? Yeah. Well, there's any number of sure, of sure people who could fall under engineer. It's true. it's true that it could have been. I was thinking that it would be an incarnation of Ben Grimm. Because Ultimate Ben Grimm was an engineer. Nice, yeah. He wasn't just you just know, the pilot. Richard's muscle head friend. But Darcy I... officially nicks names the anomaly, the hex in this episode. She does, yeah. She does. Referencing yeah. the hex abilities from that one. Hex has. bolts. Yeah, I um, think by this back... time it's been hex has been reinforced for us quite a few times. Yeah. Just going back to the newspaper, when Vision folds up the newspaper, mm-hmm. uh, the headline gets shortened to H O M. Which yes, is House home. of M. House of M. There's another. There's another one. I can't remember what episode, but the, it's a, it's an ad for hydration. Two fire hydrants. Something, and when they fold it, it says Hydra. Oh. <laughs> so there's there's, there's nice. a few of those sprinkled without. Um, 
So there's a scene here where uh, they're looking at a screen and Hayward shows a scene that we haven't seen yet, which is Wanda going to the base and finding Vision's body, which is uh, mirroring uh, West Coast Avengers comic where Vision, where they have Vision sprawled out on all kinds of tables and has just completely deconstructed while they try to rebuild him. Right. It mirrors that, that scene from that comic. Which, and then, which was a, a deleted scene. It was a post credit scene for right. uh, Endgame, Infinity War, Endgame, Endgame, that never got used. So there's a there's a neat little thing here, uh, and it's they sort of all happen together. The the scene with the where Monica references what I believe to be Reed Richards. The scene where they're looking at the the screens, and in the next scene, she she talks about how Wanda probably could have taken out Thanos if he hadn't blitzkrieged. Yeah, and then. The FBI agent says, you know, Captain Marvel came close and she just, she immediately, it's not the reaction you expect because of the relations. The last time we saw her and Captain Marvel, she was a little girl fawning over her. Yeah. And now she's like, I don't want to talk about that right now. We're talking about Wanda. And she like, she, her body, everything, she shuts right down on Captain Marvel. So something's happened there. They're, they are I at think, odds with Carol. I Dan. think that's a reference to how Captain Marvel was gone. Mm hmm. And let her mother die, perhaps. Monica's, Monica's mother died and right. Captain Marvel wasn't around. So, and then the biggest part, and this goes back to what you were talking about in episode four, and I think we even touched on a little in episode three, and that's that when they're analyzing Monica, they hold up a, basically a tablet of her body scans. Yeah. And her body, it's blank, they say, except for a little flicker in the corner. And the flicker looks like the symbol from her Captain Marvel uniform, like the symbol that sure, was on her. Sure. Uh, her, mm -hmm. her pulsar yeah, or, or sorry photon Starburst, yeah. suit yeah, right yeah, and yeah. the one that she's kind of wearing and then they analyze the clothes and she just pulls a gun out and shoots it because she's got a theory right and the, the theory is and then when they analyze it that her clothes are 85 percent kevlar and that she was wearing a kevlar vest going in okay and this is where they get the big the big eureka moment yep this is not this is not wanda creating an illusion this is not wanda uh, flexing on a mutant power of some kind to, to make you think something has happened. Yeah, it's She's really literally reality warping. Rewriting re reality. Shit. Yeah. This is the yeah. moment where they're like, oh my fuck. <laughs> She's rewriting reality. It still and doesn't. For me, that's, that's the omega level power category in, in the Yeah, Marvel yeah, universe. yeah. Of course it that's is. That's where yeah. they take her from being that, yeah. you know, the hex throwing witch where a building caves in on you or the mutant who can, you know, maybe make you have a bad day to the character that wipes out mutant kind yeah to the character well, comes... that that makes soup you know remember that comic where spider-man was a pro wrestler and had the perfect life yes from, there's a comic there I, I don't know if you guys read it no, from your explanation or from your <laughs> you have west there's a scene for me in all of comics in all of comics that it, it makes me I, i'm gonna break down now oh when when peter when they restore his memories from his perfect life and yeah. he experiences simultaneously all at once, all the tragedies that have happened to Peter Parker and he yeah. breaks in that moment. Yeah. Wow. That's the most powerful comic book moment ever. So like the fact that we might even be heading close to something like that, that this may be leading to the house of M and the way that the, the just, you know, for me, this is a trigger for that, that kicks her off into, with the way that like, the next Spider-Man cosmic is level to, power to build, like, this is this is crazy. Now we're getting into something super yeah. super it, cool. It comes up later when when it's revealed that you're the Scarlet Witch. Oh yeah, not not a Scarlet Witch. The the that means that this is a singular entity. Yeah, yeah. That has ex now. I don't know if it's a reference to she's the Scarlet Witch, and then therefore she transcends time. There's there's an instance later where she sees a vision of the shape of a woman who right. looks like she's wearing the Scarlet Witch. We don't know if that's her that's or what, a previous I, incarnation. I would have swore of the that Scarlet was Witch. the Enchantress at the time because of the yellow energy. I just yeah, took it to be. A, I went right to the Enchantress in that scene. To me, the yeah. yellow well, the yellow was uh, the was, yellow was the Mind Stone. Yeah, the Mind Stone, and that was just a vision of her future self. Yeah, that was yeah. my take on it. So there's a the, the part that we were talking about before where yeah. Vision basically touches Norm and brings him out of the Wanda's reality into reality. He starts panicking, looking for his phone. He's got to call his sister. How long have I been gone? Who the frick are you? Yeah, yeah, You've yeah. got to stop her. You've got to stop her. And it's our first real indication that stop 
it is Wanda that we need to stop. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it really is. And then because I had paused it on the previous episode and watched and read his bio, right. where this incident is actually referenced right here in the previous episode, I started to think, well, time is getting hinky now. Sure. Like, and why I doubled down on that is because in the scene with the kids where they wake up and they're like, or they, they say, where's dad? And, well, he's at work. Why is he at work? Well, it's Monday. Well, it was Saturday this morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's when I, that's why I didn't even, you know, that's why I didn't consider it a continuity er- error, like that's until fair. you had said that. Because it, it I, works perfectly like said, well in terms of time is going f- forward, back, sideways, maybe. I Like, I'm not really sure how time is, is working, it but a it's a huge... production error that fit perfectly. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. it really does, yeah. <laughs> You're listening to Fandom Power. still so the whole the the kevlar clothing thing it still doesn't explain to me how it didn't revert back to a kevlar vest when she got punted out do you know what i, I mean I th- like it, maybe i'm just getting stuck on that for for well i think it's indicative but... of an, an object that she personally manipulated she's got definitely a different she's got trust uh levels sure uh with like you know with with monica it also wasn't part of the original hex no and and also it's she physically kicks her out like i know she uses her magic but she's she you know we don't see her do that to anything else yeah right so, so ostensibly it, 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 if we could test that plastic color helicopter it oh, might yeah. be made out of polycarbonate and you know yeah. whatever, whatever, whatever sure, 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 sure. you know exactly sure. right Shook like it. or so, the, the beekeepers jump rope was you know a steel cable and uh, you sure, know all exactly, that other stuff exactly yeah. I guess so, so maybe it's like because she's school. involved in like she's rewriting the reality. So maybe she is. everybody else's clothes are have been rewritten to look like 1930s or 1950s or 1980s. But she's still rewriting that. Right. That's out of the true. clothes that they That's own. True. I mean, so this I, is what this my point is that she's not causing an illusion. No, no, no. She's rewriting reality. Well, when yeah. she's pregnant and she's doing the thing with the coats, she's not putting on a different coat every time. She's no. Not, She's physically changing her coat. Precisely. That's right. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Okay. So you can pick at it for a long time. Yeah. You oh, could. yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. One more example of the rewriting, and it comes up later. Vision finally confronts Wanda. There's a scene where oh, they, yeah. they stop being on the TV show, and they actually have an argument, like a real couple. And it it's also indicative of those, you know, on the very special episodes, mom and dad would have a big fight, maybe. It's yep. indicative yep. of that. So they're still on the show, but the characters are out of the show. Now they're into the real world. They're having a real conversation about what the frig is going on. Enough here. for you the, as the viewer. The aspect to, ratio uh... actually changes in that scene. And he literally says, you can't control me like you control them. That's right. And the first thing she does is roll credits in an attempt to shut him up. Yeah. Okay, yeah now yeah. there's something that happens there when she rolls credits. I don't know what you're talking about. Stop lying to me. Okay, follow me here. Sure. The names of the guys and the credits. Yeah. Are the real names of the people making the show? Yes. Who created the show and are creating? <laughs> who created the, the show, show within, within the, the show, show that we're watching? <laughs> oh wow! More turtles. So she's yeah, made yeah, yeah. the people that created the show we're watching characters in her reality. Yeah. And made them the characters that Production created the show yeah. that she's producing. <laughs> yeah. Bro. <laughs> Bro. The show within a My show within hurts. a show. <laughs> it hurts in like a, such a good way. Oh man. <laughs> that one is dynamite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. And he that... says he can't remember his time before That's right. Westview. The And then he says the the biggest here's here's where we get into it. Where are all the children? I wonder why they know what the children in Westview. <gasps> yeah, so this is it. Where right? are they? Every morning I go to work by the playground, there's no kids. Every time I come home from work, there's no kids. 
where are all the children? And Other that's than, the, you know, knock Billy, on the door. Uh, Billy and Tommy. Yeah. Where she creates the next crazy distraction to try to stop Vision from cracking what's actually going on here. Stop being an Avenger, you. <laughs> For the children. Now, does she create this distraction, or is this another one of uh, is this a, Agnes's Agnes, intervention? Agnes. Yeah. I don't know. It could be Agnes. I think it was, know. like, they do show her later on, on during that montage. He, she is yeah. well. Pietro's She's got quite at the, the young door. husband. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is so true. I do um, love that line. That's though. where my notes end, though, fellas. You, you can't control me like you control them. Yes, you can't control me the way you do them. And then, yes. and then it's can't like, I? can't I? Can't I? And on some level, that, no. Yeah, she no, she suddenly can't. too, right? She just rolls credits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's another story. There's another scene too, where because uh, just before I end, where Darcy says. And like, because we've been watching it and we thought it, but now she's sort of self and she does a lot of self-referencing or exposition to help us. But she literally says in the scene with the drone. Yeah. You can't see the drone in the shot because Wanda is editing her own show. Wanda decides what gets on the show. That's right. Yeah. So Wanda let the helicopter on the show. I guess so. Before she knew what it was. Right. 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 Yeah, because there is a lot of time spent on that episode. Like, what is that? And the whole picking it up and examining it and, oh, it's a toy helicopter. And so the last thing, I guess, the last thing is that as she goes back into the hex after giving them the warning. Yeah. (laughs) Is that she reaches up and she she kind of, you know, pushes her hand above her head through the hex and the entire hex becomes red. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Suggesting to me that as a drop plot point that whoever was previously in control of the hex. Yep. Isn't anymore, is no longer. and now it's all Wanda. All her, yeah. Okay, well, sure. With uh, m- my interpretation of that is, well, she no longer has to hide the hex, so now it's just a clear indication of stay the hell out. Oh, there's that too. It's true. It works on uh, on both of those levels, though. Yep. Well, they do say later on the in the beginning she didn't quite know what she was doing, but she becomes aware of it. And this is probably yeah, where she, she becomes, she, oh, this is what I'm doing. Well, she does have she a breakdown here. She's like, yeah. she, she, because she doesn't understand that she's doing it. She's like, do you think I could schedule people's laundry and dentist appointments and control what all the children are doing and making sure everybody gets to work on time? Do you think I could do that? And she's starting you, to realize, like, I'm that's doing bitch. that. <laughs> well, let's, wait a minute. Let that's me, the <laughs> level of what I'm doing here. Let me just add another and, layer to that, if I might. Going back and forth on the, is Wanda a villain? Is she not a villain? And let's remember that both Wanda and Pietro were introduced as villains back in Age of Ultron. So the whole, you know, them, it's going to come up here in my episode, in the the Halloween episode, when they talk about, where's your accent? Well, where's yours? But did you notice that whenever, so whenever Wanda is doing something that's overtly villainous, it's accented. Yep. And when she's not, it's, Purely Americanized. How villainous her is accent, singing to your children? Her accent comes back when she, when she leaves the hex. Yeah, yeah, That's exactly. The first time her accent comes back. But I mean, she's leaving the hex under the pretense of, as you say, Eric, stay the F out. Yep. Right? Yep. And I mean, that's her, call it what you will, whether it's villainous or protective or whatever. But the motivation is, this is not the, yeah. you know, Scarlet Witch who nearly took out Thanos. This is a very different character. I guess that, uh, so that's episode five, brings us around to episode six. Was there any other points on five before we move on? Oh, that's me, man. Nope. All right on. That's so ep- episode six, the all new Halloween spooktacular. This one is the Malcolm in the Middle episode, which admittedly love that show. I've never watched it, so I that really that made that it show. a little bit difficult for me to pick up on some of the stuff. Other than I get that the fourth wall breaks from the kids are uh, are emulating the that show. That's what they did. The kids talked yeah, directly to Mal- the audience. Malcolm talked to talk to camera a lot. Yeah, so yeah. for me, this one was a bit of a like, oh boy, I hope there isn't a whole lot there that I'm going to miss because I'm not familiar with that sitcom. So one of, the, one of the central themes, and this might make you want to watch it, Wes, is the normalizing of mental illness. Oh, that's totally worth looking it's, at then. It's one of the strong central themes. Like all these characters are just batshit crazy. Okay, fair enough. And uh, it's great. Brian Cranston pre-Breaking uh, Bad. Oh, yeah. really? And you can almost see it sometimes. Okay. <laughs> you can almost see it sometimes. Say my name. 
so this one uh, aired Dude. Friday, uh, Friday, February twelfth, twenty twenty one. This one is written by Chuck Hayward. I wonder mm-hmm. uh, if you're not familiar with his work. Uh, his writing credits include "Dear White People," "Stepsisters," and "Fat Camp." Hmm. Co-written by Peter Cameron, who we already talked about, wrote uh, "Carnival Row." Again, directed by Matt Shackman. So this is <laughs> in my TV guide. Wes is writing TV guide again. My episode nice. synopsis for this one is it's Halloween in Westview and Wanda, Peter and the boys go out trick or treating. Vision seizes the opportunity to put his neighborhood watch status to good use. But what he discovers is more than he expected. And the synthesoid will never be the same. So it's Halloween time. Lots of like right off the bat. As soon as the, as soon as the episode opens, we get uh Billy talking to the camera no yeah you're right it is billy so billy, billy is the wiccan yeah billy so talking to the camera closest to his mom's billy's talking to the camera and he is basically uh capping off the previous episode where as you say something bad's happened like like that whole fallout of the of the serious episode that we just had you know mom and dad have been different they're not really fighting but something's wrong that's right ever since um, uncle pietro showed up yeah exactly exactly so so much going on in this episode visually. This is the uh, the the funny ha ha. We get the treatment of all of the classic comic costumes in this one, and like I just a sitcom after being serious for two episodes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a it's a lighter tone. Well, I should say it's partly a lighter tone until we hit the end of the episode, where quite suddenly it gets very very serious again. But um, in terms of the themes i you know for me i had a real hard time sort of picking out a a pervasive theme i didn't think that there was one i just thought that you know we're in full we're in full steam now the show is moving at a at a much different pace than how it started and we are Um, like building towards that conclusion i can hit on a theme for you yeah sure so the whole episode is about halloween halloween is about wearing a costume and concealing who you are that's true and this whole episode is kind of revealing what's under the mask of Wanda's world. I suppose so. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I nice. put that together 10 seconds ago. Well, <laughs> I, then that's why you're here. <laughs> Yay, me! Uh, so talk about expectations in this one. For me, this, in hindsight especially now, because really, how do you measure expectation? Then going back and looking at it. But this one... As the whole show has done, it threw me for a loop. It kept me off my feet. It kept me guessing, particularly knowing that it was Agnes and she's playing along in her own ruse in this episode. And that for me is like, what? Because at this point I'm like, oh, maybe she is a villain. And now I'm right back to, well, fuck, I don't know anything about her. I just don't know. (laughs) Yeah. So Vision, building off of his uh, suspicions from previous episodes, is driven to figure out what's going on in Westview, why there are no other children besides Tommy and Billy. Except in this episode, miraculously, there are. We see all the kids now. So <laughs> Somebody pointed it out to her, and she didn't want to have any continuity. Or no, so I mean, rather... And, so she wrote some kids into the show. Right, and rather than face the, you know, like going all the way back to episode one with Mr. Hart and Mr. and Mrs. Hart questioning her... Rather than have to face those questions, I'll just remove any reason for you to have to ask them. So, interesting way to, to, to do that. So, Vision, still acting like an Avenger, still wanting to know what's going on, he decides that he's going to go off and do the neighborhood watch thing. But he doesn't actually tell Wanda that he's not on duty that day. He is literally going out on his own and is going to figure out what's going on. So I thought that was really, really cool that, again, uh, playing off that, I'm still an Avenger. I still want to do the right thing that he he does. Wanda basically is the, uh, you know, plays her own little sleuthing game with Pietro, and she starts trying to question him, trying to throw him off, because he even makes a reference about, you're testing me. And, uh, you know, because she's asking, like, the whole, uh, again, the accent thing. Where's your accent? Where's yours? You're right. You know? <laughs> It's um, funny to me, every time she tries to pry into him, 
he punches her right in an emotional button that just shuts her up. Yeah, so true. Like every time. I do that with my siblings from time to time, so it's a totally real thing. Mm. But it also works on the level of like, nope, don't don't investigate me. This one for me connects directly to episode nine in, uh, in the sense that Agnes is trying to steal Wanda's powers but she wants to understand it more. This to me is, is Agnes directly puppeting Pietro's questioning. You know, it's literally it's Agnes on. like, yeah, exactly. Eric, like she is literally, you know, hand up the butt, you know, mouthing the words, you know, tell me what I want to know. Pushing buttons, forcing yeah, that Totally. I had strings, but now I'm free. No strings to hold me down. <laughs> Let's talk about the costuming for a second here, oh, and the way man. that it's the way that it's described. So the boys, the boys have their traditional Wiccan and Speed costumes. That's not actually the Speed costume, but it's a reference to. It's close enough that I mean, you you know, we know what yeah. they're trying to get at. Wanda coming down the stairs yeah. in the traditional tights. Uh, tights, cape, you know, elbow length gloves, and the the, the headpiece. I'm a Sokovian fortune teller. Writing it off as a Sokovian fortune teller. Wow. That is so Rad. lame. Lame. That's pretty cool. <laughs> but then how do you, how do you explain, and I like the way they did it, because one, I'm a, I'm a big fan of this to begin with. So how do you explain what the, the traditional comic book vision looks like? How do you explain that? You know, and, and he does a, a great job. He doesn't come out and say luchador, but he's like Mexican wrestling. Me gusta mucho. Chili con carne. Oh. Yeah. I'm like, oh, that totally <laughs> yeah. makes sense that he's supposed it's to be a, a supposed to be a luchador. It's and, so good. And obviously Evan Peters as, uh, <sighs> Quicksilver. as Quicksilver. Spot on. Quicksilver with his blown back hair. I want to talk about sort of, again, the strong points in this episode in, in terms of what it does really well and what it gets right. The single biggest piece for me is Agnes playing along with her own ruse like that above everything else is like, Oh, that is so clever, you know, right down to him, you know, doing his, the vision touch, waking her up mm -hmm. and then putting her back to sleep, which really is nothing because she's doing that. Yes. But at the same time, the costume she's wearing is another she's right in your face. No, which costume? <laughs> you did do the nose. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and so the boys, right at the beginning, where they're talking about mom and dad fighting, there's a there's a bit of a an illusion there when um, Vision goes to leave the house. Like, have a good night, dear. He turns back and he he I can't remember if he points at her, but he definitely locks eyes with her and he tells her, Wanda. Be good. Be good. You know, which oh, to me yeah. was a direct call back to that. You can't control me like you control them. And he, it's his way of acknowledging, I know something is up. And I know that you're involved in this somehow. Be good. I thought that was just a clever little... Uh, yeah. It echoes later on. Yeah, it really does. And then, of course, we get that, you know, again, talking about the, her level of influence over the people around her seem to be directly influenced by their proximity to her because as Vision starts walking through the town... The further away he gets. You, you get that scene where the woman's hanging out the... Is it a ghost off the tree or laundry? So. And she just keeps repeating the same, the same moment over and over and over again with the tears rolling down her face. And you're like, oh, something's not right. Until finally he gets out to the edge, edge of town and like nobody is moving and he's trying to have this conversation. Uh, sir, sir, sir? Are you waiting for something? You know, and then of course in the, at, at the, what do they call it? The, the pop-up base? Mm -hmm. At the sword base, you've got, you know, now they've got actual monitoring going on and they're like, these people are barely moving. Like even they're questioning what's going on in there. It's true. Another strong point for me Vision breaking through the anomaly and the, oh man, I didn't even know the emphasis he puts on it, the, the way he emotes when he is like, he's being rendered apart on a, on a metaphysical level and yeah. he's screaming, the people need help. The people need help. He's ever, yeah. ever the hero, ever the, yes. you know, like, I'm just like, 
that was almost like a I'm gonna cry moment. <laughs> yeah, and you get for sure. Uh, you get Haywood. Wow, he really wants out. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> So, I mean, uh, in a nutshell, I mean, the episode does a great job at subverting us uh, with this. It, it has a who, Drink. there's a who done it tone and the dialogue, right? Where you're just, you're never clear on anything. And the, the nuance of the show just shines through in spades in this one. Anything else you guys think that uh, the episode did really well? My favorite thing was the, uh, the retro costumes. I just, I couldn't get enough. It's hard not to. Uh, the ET vibe, you know, every time, every time there's a Halloween scene outside, I always get the ET vibe. Yeah, I was actually true. surprised that there weren't any Star Wars costumes in the show, seeing as yeah, the company yeah, owns yeah, them, yeah. owns them both. But I can see how they want to keep those apart. It's true. Okay, so now I didn't have a lot to say. I mean, we've we've I th- we've pretty much universally, I don't want to say we've gushed, but we've been very high praise of the show. I'm going to take a minute. I'm going to be critical of this episode as I'm, I really want to point out again, and this, this is a, Oh, this is a prevailing theme within the MCU. If I ever had any, if I had any criticism, certainly phase three criticisms, this one builds on that. And it's Hayward. Mm -hmm. Hayward is a, is a weak point in the show. And I say it from this perspective. He's another one of them that suffers from Tony Stark syndrome. That's not exactly how I remember it. He's Stark when Stark was at his most paranoid. He's the catalyst why the Avengers, why we need a suit in every city, why we need to put the put a little team together. If you took Tony Stark and Thaddeus Ross and jammed them into one person, it's Hayward. Do you know what I mean? Like the way that yeah, yeah. the way that he pursues Wanda the same way that Thunderbolt Ross was going after the Hulk with mm-hmm. the same paranoia that led Tony Stark to do all the batshit crazy stuff that he did. Yes. Yeah. So the suspicions and the methods are like there are tropes that we've seen play out time and again over the course of the MCU, and that familiarity to me makes him a, a pretty weak antagonist. He's also a white straight head of a government organization. <laughs> well, it's not like we haven't He's... seen that either. Like super well, head of super secret organization is suspicious of everything. Hmm. Where have we seen that He's... before? He's the most vanilla yogurt bad guy of all the vanilla yogurt bad guys we've seen in the MCU. Yeah. 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 I say it like this. I think he's a, uh... He's an overzealous, righteous ass who's learned nothing from any of the other super secret agencies that came before him. He probably takes a little bit out of uh, the comic book version of Stryker, where he's, you know, he's building this thing because he's afraid of the thing that he's building. You know what I mean? Right. They're building a sentient weapon because, oh my God, look at how powerful the vision was. He was a sentient weapon. We can't allow those to exist without having our own. And, you know, the turtles go down. Well, that raises a good question, Eric. Is sort of is sort of the direct spawning of the fact that the vision exists? I think that's well, given that Monica's mother founded Sword, it was probably started genuinely to 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 deal with discovery and how to deal with and contain and research these things. But the acronym, the acronym is, is, uh, the MCU acronym specifically calls back to, uh, sentient weapons. Sentient weapons. So it, yeah, where, where have we, where does sentient weapon come up? So the first time that sentient weapon comes up, it is Captain Marvel because she is trained to be the weapon of the Kree. You know, when when you start throwing the word in, when you start throwing sentience around, to I, me, it's I a understand. little it's a little on the nose, like, because, yes, we're talking about things that have a higher intelligence, but I automatically go to machine or not, not would, living. Things that are not normally sentient, or else right. why would you reference it? Yeah. That is our, that is our, that is our interpretation, but it, it, yeah. the, the, the descriptor can also be applied to somebody who is oh, certainly trained and lives their entire life made to be nothing but a weapon. And 
because the definition goes both ways. Yeah. I think that's why the acronym was made in the first place. So, so sword in the 1990s doesn't exist. It's still no. shield. That's so it. sword as an yeah. organization doesn't doesn't show up until the post credit scene with uh, um, Nick Fury in space. Yeah, so right. from my train of thought, when you talk about the ascension weapon program, that's a direct result. Again, it's a, I hate to say it, but it's a Tony Starkism. Tony Stark created Ultron. That's the Ultron, reason. That's what I was going to say. That's for the my, reason. For my definition yeah. of sentient weapon, Ultron is the first sentient weapon. That's that we the have. reason that you would have it. And because, that's you know, fair. because Vision is an offshoot of Ultron, that's the reason from it. And once again, just like the, I don't want to say it's a failing, but just like some of the criticisms with Spider-Man, where Spider-Man can't just be Spider-Man because he's now the prodigal son of Tony Stark, all the villains, you know, the uh, Vulture is is a villain because of Tony Stark because his his cleanup crew gets usurped. Remember Iron, remember, and... remember Iron Wars? Mm, yeah. No, not really. In the Iron Man comics that where oh, it's Tony Stark basically for a, a full year of continuity. Okay, just hunted down derivative Marvel villains that had his tech. Oh, really? His tech. Oh and right, right, right. The, it's the it's the Clone Wars of Tony Stark, right? Like right. Uh, down, Crimson like, you know, Dynamo, the Beetle, and Gladiator, and like every minor or tertiary armor. villain that's got some part piece of Stark tech or trying to ape Crimson Stark tech. Dynamo. The yeah. Armor Wars, so it's yeah, called the yeah. Armor, armor Wars. Wars. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That storyline, yes, I have heard of that. I'm not familiar. Yeah. I didn't read it, but but in in the con in the context, kind of what the, they were shooting for in Iron Man too. In the context of the MCU, do you see where I'm going? Where like mm-hmm. Tony Tony Stark is his own worst enemy, and all of the all of the 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 villains, like the phase, a lot of the Phase Three villains, uh, the weaker moments sort of spawn out of him and his failings. Yeah. You know, and this well, to me kind of like oh, it's shoehorned right in there. We get another Tony I feel Stark simultaneously bad about Tony Stark. Because they put it all on him in the MCU, and yeah. he doesn't really have it all put on him in the comic universe. No, and I also feel like that we've done Hank Pym a disservice in the MCU. Oh yeah, it's all Hank Pym in the comics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually, when we started this, I actually, when I was doing my preamble, I was actually going to start with Iron Man, uh, you know, and, and talk about how Iron Man, arguably, was a tertiary character prior to the film. And had been for, well, I mean, quite a while. Once Agreed. they sold off their their best characters to Sony, who do we have left Ugh. that is even remotely interesting? Oh, let's they did go a with lot Iron with Iron Man. They did. They went. They did a Hail Mary, and they 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 were actually well. And that's successful. that's a whole other thing too, Eric. You can't. You that's can't all on lay, the back of. You can't RPG. lay that out at Sony, like, and that's why I I I dumbed down my intro to the near bankruptcy of the 1990s. We have to remember that the sale of these characters saved the company. Yep. So mm-hmm. you, you can't say, you know, Sony and Sony's only time, partly responsible. Only film rights too. That's right. right. That's so right. There's only partial sales. And at a time when you're facing losing everything, giving up something innocuous that hardly anybody's doing anyway. Super that's right. Film. Yeah. We'll throw them a bone, you know? Yep. So yeah, uh, pro- I mean, all their money was being generated at the time from the actual print media and in, from cartoons and from toys. Interestingly enough, there was a point in the 1990s uh, where Sony did try to buy all of uh, Marvel's characters. They tried to buy the whole thing, but it didn't work out. So, but yeah, so that's... Um, we that's... could argue the evil corporation side of it for, for, for a long time. <laughs> if I had to lay it out, what does this episode get wrong? It's it's that aspect of it. And I'm not saying that, yes, Hayward is a bit of a weak villain if you take all of that away. But when you when you look at what's come before it and all the, the things that I previously said, that is my biggest my biggest nitpick with this episode is like, oh, again, I think that's just a symptom of the MCU, man. Maybe. Every MCU movie ends up being the hero fights his shadow. And even this show, Vision yeah. fights another Vision, well, that, and a yeah. witch fights another witch. That's mm-hmm. right. I guess very on the nose, and I think it's meant as meta commentary about its own MCU continuity. Like, hey, you, you remember how you all complained that our our characters fight themselves? Yeah. Well, here's a character literally fighting himself. I actually felt that to be a strong point of the episode um, when we get to nine. 
it's very strong, but it's also like a slap in the face if if you're one of those people who's like, oh, they only do the the mirror match. Uh, yeah, I guess so. It, it's meta commentary on top of meta commentary wow. on top of a good story. If Marvel and Sony can continue to play nice, then maybe we'll get that Spidey Venom face off. <sighs> So let me just let me just continue in the vein here Get on it. on the on the tail end of you know what does the episode do wrong? I want to talk about missed opportunities because we've now had two episodes with Uncle Pietro around. I have to say I, I'm going to frame it this way: clearly, the writers and the showrunners they knew what they were doing, but I would be lying if I said that I'm not disappointed that the inclusion of Evan Peters was not the introduction of mutants into the MCU. He probably suppressed a lot of the trauma. And I say it this way. How many times has Spider-Man been rebooted for the film, uh, for, for, for film? This is our third Spider-Man. We're on our third iteration of Spider-Man. The one thing that this current version did right was skipped over Uncle Ben and the origins of Peter Parker. We know it. It's true. He just gave us Spider-Man in the way that we wanted him. And so we in got, my mind, we, yeah, yeah, we go ahead. Uncle Ben, we got the Uncle Ben story in like two sentences in Homecoming, and that's all it needed because that was as all we viewers, we we're already we know the character, we know that that character is bankable. The general film going audience knows who Peter Parker is. They know who Spider Man is. They don't need Uncle Ben and with great power comes great responsibility one more time. No. So here I was, and I was I was elated when the knock on the door came, and yep. they spun the camera around, and there's Evan Peters, and I'm like, boom, mutants in the MCU. They've always been there. No origins. Go. I thought, they're giving us the Spider-Man homecoming introduction of mutants. Like, we don't need an explanation. We know who the X-Men are. We've got well, 20 years of X-Men films that tell us who they are. We don't need an origin for them. Well, so this is a carrot. Do you think so? It's just a carrot because the uh, I don't think you pull that big a reveal off yet. I think that's a movie. I think that's that's a I, billion dollar movie. My uh, opinion on the mutant thing, and I've I've told you this before, Wes, and I don't know if you remember. My opinion was sure they made a big deal out of the massive amount of radiation that was created when Thanos made the first snap. Yeah. And my thought was that that combined with the two subsequent snaps. Yeah. Is enough to uh, trigger the that radiation was going to be what caused mutants. Sure. That's what I've maintained the whole time. Now, there's going to be multiversal stuff going on as we see later on. Yeah. Doctor Strange's next movie. There's a little tease at the end of WandaVision. You get a you get the whole multiverse thing combined with the, the the Infinity Stones, and there's there's so many angles that it could be introduced right. on. Yep, that I wasn't as disappointed as you seem to be. Yeah, I do think that using him as a boner joke was a little bit of a waste. Like, I think that's, that's a meta reference to his actual name, which is another. I, I, I I'm sure it is, but for like. Penis. For the people who for the people who don't do what we do and yeah, dive yeah, this yeah, far yeah, yeah, in, yeah. like they're like Haha, penis joke, and that's that's the extent of what it is. Who beefed in so, your borscht? Right. <laughs> I think there's two things here though that let us. I think that that, that we're going to get what we want out of this, but I think it just might be a slower crawl. There's two things here that sort of solidify that for me. Yeah, and that's that uh, when you see. Evan Peters' character, Pietro, use his powers in the show. Yes. He has the same power signature as the MCU. He does, uh, yeah. He absolutely does. Not the X-Men. The the kind of slightly signature. blue trail of whatever right. that is, the blur, I guess. Right. Yeah. And then there's a, another reference, okay, and this might be even stretching it more, but I think it's Tommy's, he refers to something as being, he sees a costume, he goes, oh, that's kick-ass. And then one oh, is like, yeah, kick-ass. Yeah. yeah. And so the actor... That's a that yeah. That's in my list. Kick ass is the actor that played <laughs> Aaron Quicksilver Taylor. In Aaron the Taylor MCU. Johnson. Yeah. So oh my I, god. Yes, sir. I and cannot so, believe I didn't make that connection. Well, let right me now. let me close the circle on that one. 
in Kick Ass, Evan Peters was Aaron Taylor Johnson's best friend. Yes. They were both in it. Yes. Oh. I don't think so we give wait. up on Evan Peters yet. I don't think we give up on this group of mutants in any shape or form. Okay. I don't think it takes it off the table. The first, the first class people. mutants, you mean? Yes. Okay. Two of the main people yeah. from Kick-Ass both became quick. So. Yeah, they both played yes. the same character in two different universes. Yes. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Kick-Ass. It's all a simulation. Okay. So that's Turtle that's going to take me right into the... Uh, um, Easter eggs. Well, I guess before I hit Easter, I'll, t- I'll touch on this one. The uh, Wanda warning the kids not to go past whatever intersection as a nice little way of her like protecting them from the reality of don't walk outside of the anomaly. <laughs> yeah, and don't walk outside of here and, you know, cease to exist. All right, so Easter eggs. We've touched on the classic costumes, the Sokovian fortune teller, the luchador, Quicksilver, Wicked, and Speed. Classic costumes. That was a highlight for me. Uh, mm-hmm. as we just talked about the kick ass, that was another one on my list. Anybody got any more? Cause I've got quite a few, uh, the movie theater. Yeah. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah. T- touch on the no, marquee, the, the, the marquee in the, in the, in the town square, they're showing two films. Yes, they are. The Incredibles. Yep. A movie about trap. Uh, so, uh, uh, Incredibles. A movie about a family of superheroes, superhero family uh, movie through going through the existential crisis of dealing with their powers in a world that doesn't want them. And the parent trap, a movie about (laughs) twins, twins pulling the switcheroo on their parents in an effort to get them back together. Mom and dad are fighting. (laughs) That's kind of a cute. (laughs) It's very self-referential. I love it. Also represents twin switching places like Pietro being switched for Pietro. Uh, also a uh, reference to Wanda and Pietro being twins, <laughs> right? It just turtles, it, man. Yep. It's a, that, that hole runs deep anymore. Peter's got a tattoo on his shoulder. That most people have interpreted to say mom, M O M. Yeah. But, and I don't know if it's a real tattoo. I never went so far as to look that up, but I interpreted it to look more like an H O M, which is house of them. <laughs> house of them. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'm fishing with a long pole now. I'm going to have to go looking for that because yeah. I don't recall. All right, and I'm going to... Yeah, just Ag- Agnes's witch costume, which was just... So yeah, awesome. so I, I had that one as well. I'm going to run through the ones quickly here, through the ones that we didn't touch on. Uh, Yo Magic. The Yo Magic yogurt commercial. Mm-hmm. It's <laughs> it's a on-the-nose allegory for Agnes stealing the powers of other witches. Yo Magic. Your Magic. So quite literally, it's your magic in it. The whole idea of the, the the kid on the tropical island being wasted away to nothing, that is a visual representation of the decay of those the witches. <laughs> so quite literally, the shark is Agnes in that commercial. There's also something to be said of, you know, the shark gives you what you want, but ultimately, you, you know, you don't get what you want out of being given what you want. Yeah, there's some meta, sort of psychological stuff going on there. That's true. Uh, which uh, which Infinity Stone is this? Oh, good lord! So we had the ether, which was the the uh, the spilt juice. Right. right. We yeah, had the time stone. The, the time stone in the hydro. The time stone was the watch. The yeah. mind um, stone was the uh, toaster. Was the toaster. Uh, the bath bomb was. Uh, the space stone, I think so. I think. Bath powder. Yeah. I don't so, know. so what's left? We got the soul stone. We got the the power stone. Uh, the power stone. We do have more episodes than stones, though, so maybe they skip one. Well, there was That's no commercial. Well, in this the is episode. it, right? Like, how many commercials skip, yeah. are there? Are there are there six commercials? Ooh. Yeah. So I think that. Haha. <laughs> Lugal I vision. Actually, will tell I actually us. think that the toast <laughs> toaster was the power stone. Oh well, maybe. But, was it red? Um, it is yeah. the dot is red on the toaster. Yeah, yeah that's true. But the but, uh, uh, power stone is the purple one. It's the one that uh, Thanos. Uh, yeah, the colors don't quite match up. Yeah, I guess not. But I think that the soul stone gets. I think that this is either the soul stone or the mind stone. But possibly, again. you know, the soul stone on some level makes sense because that kid fades away to a skeleton, and who is the guardian of the soul stone? The um, red skull the commercial. Mm-hmm. Uh, the red the skull is no the guardian, magic. right? All right. Well, Andy's looking that up. I'm going to keep moving forward here. We get uh, a warning, <laughs> uh, a warning from Darcy 
telling Monica not to traverse the anomaly again as her cells have already been altered twice already. This is an allusion to her transformation into her hero form, photon spectrum, etc., etc. Again, the Westview anomaly is quite literally a giant hexagon, so that's reinforced once again. And this one, I really laughed at this one. When Darcy and uh, she's got to break into, they, they sneak back into the, the pop-up base and she's got to crack into the computers, she comes across a file and that file's title is Cataract. Cataract, yeah. a file on the sword network that Darcy discovers. Right. Cataracts being a uh, vision condition that cloud your vision and they tend to be white and milky. White mm. cataract, white vision. <laughs> Very ha good. ha ha! Very good. Very yeah, very yeah. nicely done, sir. Were were there any more files that had nothing to do with this? That it was too fast. The the camera paused yeah. long enough on cataract for me to go, oh, cataract! Ha ha! That's funny. I didn't I'm catch. Sure, there was else, probably yeah. other little tidbits in there that have nothing to do with Wandavision. And then outside of uh, Agnes's or Agatha's witch costume, we do get. Both Tommy and Billy get to showcase their powers a little bit here. So we, we see that they are, in fact, uh, powered. So the the Wiccan and Speed characters are legit. And that, my okay. friends, is what I have for episode six. Uh, there's one thing about the, uh, the theater. My notes here that you guys didn't mention. I was saving. I thought you were going to hit it. That's why I didn't No, say no, it. that's in episode nine. I think <laughs> if you're going where I think you're going. So the theater is called The Coronet. The Coronet, yes. Right? So the poem The Coronet was written by uh, an English poet, Andrew Marvel. Oh, wow. It's about, it's about ah, a guy ah. who knows that the sins of man led to the death of Christ. And he's okay. trying to make a new crown for Christ's head to oh, atone wow. for the sins of man. But he finds that there's sin in this too, as the devil is entwined in it. And therefore, he must achieve some glory with this new creation. The devil is entwined in it. So another <laughs> another Mephisto reference. Mm-hmm. The devil's in the details, Doc. But there's oh, another, you know, God. and then Pedro says some pretty crazy things here that maybe maybe there's something else going on with Pedro that's either not what we've been hoping or maybe something even bigger. Maybe. Uh, he tells the kids, unleash hell, demon spawn. Oh, that's right. Yes, 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 like, yes. Unleash hell, demon spawn! You know, doesn't that sound like something the devil would say? Absolutely. And I mean, if if we're doing the that the kids are a fracture of, of Mephisto's soul, they quite literally demon spawn. So he also says in this scene, kids need a father figure. Vision's not around. Yeah, that's right. Don't sweat it, sis. It's not like your dead husband could die twice. That's so, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of dangling, dangling, dangling threads, man. Great. Yeah. That's funny. Next time on the thrilling conclusion of Fan Division. Her coven tries to kill her. Yeah, <laughs> yes. You are being ostracized for using the dark magics that we don't yeah. touch. Indeed, she is Agatha Harkness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey guys, thanks for listening to Fandom Power. Be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Stay tuned for our next episode where we'll be talking about another one of your favorite fandoms. Fandom Power is a Sawcast production.